Good evening. Welcome to MUFON Los Angeles. My name is Steve Marillo. I am the state section director for MUFON LA. We have a very, very interesting program for you tonight. Preston Dennett is going to be talking to us about UFOs over California. California is the leading producer of UFO reports in the United States, and tonight you're going to find out why. In his dynamic slideshow presentation, researcher and author Preston Dennett will share the results of his 20 years of investigation into the phenomenon of UFOs. He'll reveal the latest info on California's top 20 cases, including encounters over California's military bases and installations, including the decades-long ongoing UFO saga at Edwards Air Force Base. Events that have occurred here may rival that of Roswell. The Coronado Island UFO incident, a groundbreaking 1994 abduction case involving more than six independent witnesses and medical evidence. Dennett will show how these adults were brought together to participate in one of the most well-verified UFO contacts in history. Are there under, underwater UFO bases off the coast of Southern California? Dennett, who has personally investigated dozens of reported USOs, will present his theory of a possible base in the Santa Catalina Channel. And finally, 1992 Topanga Canyon UFO wave. On June 14th of 1992, more than 17 witnesses observed UFOs over the Santa Monica Mountains, launching a two-year-long wave of UFO uh, sightings. Dennett has eyewitness drawings, photographs, and audio tapes, and he's going to share them with us tonight. If you would, put your hands together for noted author and UFO researcher Preston Dennett. Welcome, Preston. Thank you very much. My lecture tonight is UFOs over California. Um, but before I actually start my lecture, let me tell you a little bit about myself. I started investigating UFOs in 1987 following a sighting over Alaska by a Japanese airliner. Um, this was, the pilot was Kenju Tiroshi, and uh, he said he saw two UFOs pacing his plane for several miles. And uh, it was caught on radar, not only on the onboard radar, but on land radar. So I made the mistake of asking my friends and family, what do you think of this nut who saw a UFO? And uh, I got a real shock. I found out my brother had chased a UFO across the San Fernando Valley. My sister-in-law saw a UFO with her friends and then also saw gray type ETs. My other sister-in-law saw ETs. Uh, I found that I had two friends who had had missing time encounters. So it really hit home for me, and that's how I got started. Since then, I've written a number of books and a number of articles, and it's pretty much taken over my life, but I'm happy about it. I'm not complaining. Um, my lecture tonight is UFOs over California, and it's broken down into two parts. The first part is basically the top 20 California UFO encounters. And uh, the second part are the cases that I've got a lot of information on, including, as Steve said, the Topanga Canyon UFO wave, the underwater UFO activity in the Santa Catalina Channel. I recently did a History Channel segment, Deep Sea UFOs, and we got such a huge response that they called me back again. We've got a bunch of new witnesses and new information. So that's really exciting. And what I found out about Edwards Air Force Base, I almost decided to write another book about it. But um, I put it all into the book, UFOs Over California. And, uh, which is this book here, and that's what I'm going to be talking about mostly tonight. I also want to talk about the Coronado Island UFO incident, which I think is one of the most important multiple witness accounts of an extraterrestrial visitation. It's got amazing physical evidence, including implants and other medical evidence. Okay, now I know you guys are probably pretty educated on the subject of UFOs. By a show of hands, how many of you um, subscribe to the MUFON Journal? Okay, not enough of you. Shame on you. Okay, well then some of this stuff will be new to you, I hope. Um, but I'm going to go through the, this first part pretty quickly because I got a lot of information I want to share and not near enough time. But I, what I did is I researched all the California cases and I found out that California is basically the leading state in the nation for UFO encounters. It's got three times as much as 
Texas and twice the amount of Washington State. So for whatever reason, I think it's the military bases, perhaps it's because we've got the largest population in the United States, but, uh, or maybe, I don't know, the smog. Um, but we do have the most UFO encounters. Now, I judged the top 20 UFO encounters by certain criteria, which ones I thought were the most famous or the most influential or the most important. So I'm just going to go through them pretty quickly. Now, have ever, any of you ever heard of uh, the Cisco Grove encounter where in 1965 on Labor Day, where uh, a man, he's, this is a pseudonym, Donald Smythe, was a hunter. And he was hunting with his friends when he became lost. And uh, he saw what he thought was a helicopter coming to rescue him. And instead, it wasn't a helicopter, it was a UFO. And it landed next to him. And he ran up a tree and took refuge there because these beings came out and actually tried to flush him out of the tree. This was a very well-researched case by a number of investigators. And uh, it was one of actually the first robot UFO encounters reported. Um, so it's a very interesting case. All these cases are in my book, but again, I want to go through them pretty quickly. Um, number 19, I put in Ronald Reagan's UFO sighting. Now, this was just pretty much alleged. He never really gave any interviews about it. But his, the pilot who was flying Ronald Reagan said that the, a UFO appeared behind their plane, and Ronald and Nancy actually wanted him to chase it, and they became very interested in the subject after this. And uh, later, a journalist for the Wall Street Journal Norman Miller actually interviewed Reagan and asked him if he believed in UFOs. And this is a quote from Miller. When I asked him that question, or a look of horror, or here, wait a second, then. Oh, no, first, Miller interviewed Ronald Reagan, and Ronald Reagan replied, yes, we followed it for several minutes. All of a sudden, to our utter amazement, it went straight up into the heavens. We got off the plane, I told Nancy all about it, and we read up on the long history of UFOs. And then Miller asked him if he believed in UFOs, and this is what Miller said. When I asked him that question, a look of horror came over his face. It suddenly dawned on him what he was saying, the implications, and that he was talking to a reporter. He snapped back to reality and said, let's just say that on the subject of UFOs, I'm an agnostic. Which I thought was kind of a funny quote. Okay, let's move along. Uh, number 18. I, uh, put as the Brush Creek encounter, which occurred in April of 1953 to two miners of a titanium mine who saw a UFO appearing regularly over a period of three months on the same exact day. So on the fourth month, everyone was predicting another sighting, and more than 250 people showed up with snack bars, and they were selling all sorts of stuff, but uh, the UFO never showed up. But it was a very interesting case, because there's a lot of UFOs that have shown interest in mines. Um, Number 17, uh, April 14, 1954, United Airlines Flight 193 was forced to make an emergency landing after it had a near miss with the UFO. As a result, a stewardess fractured her ankle and a passenger broke his leg. So it was a pretty major encounter and was very famous. And Donald Kehoe, who investigated it, said the Air Force tried to cover it up. I put as case number 16, the case of Melinda Leslie which I wrote about in detail in this book, Extraterrestrial Visitations. Um, I chose her because she's been very outspoken about her encounters, and uh, I interviewed her. She had an amazing abduction event on the Angeles Crest Highway, and uh, I would talk more about it, but I just don't have the time. I want to get to the really good stuff. Um, okay. Let me see. Number 15, I put as the case of Morgana Van Clausen. This is a lady, this is a pseudonym, who has been experiencing UFO encounters her, most of her life. And at one point, she was diagnosed with a cyst in her breast. And before the encounter, she had a UFO sighting. And the evening before her surgery, actually, she had a bedroom visitation with some type of ETs. And uh, she went to the doctor, and there was no evidence of the cyst. And Bill Hamilton investigated this case and was actually able to get the before and after x-rays. So I think this is amazing medical evidence. And I actually wrote a book of, called UFO Healings, which outlines 100 cases of this type. I talked to another lady who had, had the same exact experience. She lived in Acton, had a cyst in her breast, had a visitation, went to the doctor. The cyst was gone, but the surgeons started arguing with her. That they said, you had surgery, didn't you? You've got a laser scar here. She denied it. She did not want to tell them about her UFO encounters. 
And uh, her MRI showed that she had, in fact, had some type of surgery. Okay, number 14, I put is the Camarillo sightings. This was in late November and early December of 1996, when basically just unexplained lights appeared for several days in a row over Camarillo. What makes this case amazing is that they were photographed and filmed, and it's really great evidence of UFOs. All right, number uh, 13, I put is the LAX sightings. I found out that airports actually have a lot of UFO sightings. It's not at all uncommon. And LAX has a really long history of sightings stretching back at least to 1950. Um, in July 15, 1952, they were seen hovering right next to the airport towers for four days in a row. And since then, pretty much every five or ten years or so, I mean, 1966, 1973, 1992, 95, 97, 2002, 2003, it goes on, and some of these have actually been filmed and caught on radar as well. So, uh, number 12 is, is there an underwater base? And uh, I'm going to save that actually for just a little bit while I go through the other cases. Number, t um, where is 11? Oh yeah, 11 is the UFO contactees, which this was an era in the 1950s, which I'm sure you all know about, in which a lot of people claimed to see human-looking aliens, which were friendly. And uh, this fad seemed to have passed, but actually I've talked to a lot of people who claimed to have seen human-looking aliens and had very benevolent encounters. The contacting movement basically went underground. It didn't stop. Um, number 10, I put is the Topanga Canyon UFO wave, which I'm definitely going to save because I've got some really amazing stuff there. Number nine is the California airship wave. This actually stretched across the United States and was one, the United States' first UFO wave, which occurred in 1896. Um, a lot of you probably have heard of this. Um, they involved Zeppelin-like objects, which were not your typical modern like UFOs. And at the time, the consciousness of the population wasn't really set on aliens. So a lot of people thought they were from Cuba or other foreign countries. It wasn't until 1947 that really the extraterrestrial theory took hold. And which, by the way, I am convinced is the valid theory. Um, I don't think that the other theories of a you know, phenomenon or time travelers, well, but I think some time travel, but I do believe that the best theory to explain UFOs is extraterrestrial. Okay, six is the Coronado mass encounter. That's another one I'm going to save. I'm just saving those best ones. Um, number five is the Tahunga Canyon abductions, which are very well known and investigated by Ann Ruffle. Um, I won't talk much about those other than to say that they occurred in 1953 and were among the very first cases to be reported in the United States, although the phenomena clearly goes back farther than that. Uh, number three is the Battle of Los Angeles. This was a very famous UFO event. I have a photograph here of the UFO that was sighted over Los Angeles, and this was in uh, 1942. And a blackout was enforced over the whole city. So, uh, and more than 1,300 rounds of ammunition were shot at this object, which was never brought down. Okay. Getting right close to the good stuff now. Number two is, uh, I put as the implant removal surgeries by Dr. Roger Lear, which I think really have the potential to change the face of UFO research because some of these implants that are coming out are just extraordinary. I mean, they emit an electromagnetic field. These are clearly not, you know, ordinary objects. Okay, now, number one, I put is the Edwards Air Force Base visitations. When I first, as I said, I, when I first started investigating this, I was shocked to find out how many encounters are going on at Edwards Air Force Base, and in fact, all California military bases pretty much have had a number of visitations. Um, in 1950, for example, Alameda Naval Station had an encounter. Um, March Air Force Base in 1951 had a very interactive encounter in, in which a plane was chasing a UFO and the, the pilot actually ran out of fuel um, and had to have a forced landing. Um, 1953, 1955, there was another um, in May 1952, uh, George Air Force Base had a series of visitations through the entire month um, on May 1st, May 9th, May 11th, May 13th, and May 20th. 
these disks overflew the base and would hover for hours. And uh, these were seen, of course, by people all over the base. And uh, people actually farther around, people residents around the base. Um, another really interesting UFO encounter occurred at Seal Beach when the Saturn rocket was being built. This giant disk came over and hovered right over the Saturn rocket, and it was seen by over 400 employees. Um, but of course, you didn't hear anything about it. Um, there's, there's just so much going on. Now, Edwards Air Force Base is where the Air Force tests a lot of its top secret aircraft and their latest cutting edge stuff, so it's no surprise that people see stuff over there. But what's happening there goes way beyond just sightings. The first sightings started in July um, 1947. This was during a massive UFO wave and basically the beginning of the modern age of UFOs. And uh, on July 8th of 1947, this is Blue Book case, unidentified number 50. Uh, three silver disks were seen directly over the base. And a couple of hours later, another pilot saw a disk. And uh, after that, another pilot did. And uh, a few hours later, several people at the base saw an another disk. So these sightings put the base on high alert, and they changed basically the way the Air Force dealt with UFOs. Hynek was brought in, and he declared it unidentified. And uh, Edward Ruppelt said, from that point on, all cases that involved national security bypassed Blue Book and were sent to the Air Technical Command. So the sightings continued. In 1952, there was another sighting, very dramatic. And these are just a few of the sightings I'm mentioning here. Um, in 1958, Gordon Cooper, our astronaut, was actually at the base when a UFO landed. He did not see it land. He talked to two airmen who were out on the dry lake bed when they saw the silver disk come straight down, land, and they took this movie footage of it. And Gordon Cooper saw the movie footage, actually developed it, and he sent it off to his superiors and never saw it again, and investigators have not been able to retrieve it. But uh, clearly there's a lot of evidence that we're not seeing. Um, in 1965, Edwards had one of its biggest encounters in which seven UFOs were seen hovering over the base Pilots were scrambled after it. These were caught on radar. Um, this chase went on for over two hours, and uh, Stephen Greer, researcher Stephen Greer, has actually got the transcripts of this event. So it's very good evidence. Um, 1967, a pilot was actually chased by six UFOs over the base. Um, 1978, there was a military worker who was working on the base in construction, and he said this tiny orange-sized UFO came down. It was almost clear and it hovered around as if it was examining things and then darted straight up. So, I mean, you get all kinds. Um, in 1995, there was another massive sighting, 1998. But, of course, you know, as I said, this goes way beyond just sightings. There are actually several accounts of UFO crashes, UFOs being held at the base, and, of course, a very famous uh, meeting with Eisenhower and the aliens, um, which started out as a rumor, but... Uh, well, let me just start. In 1952, Leonard Stringfield, he's a researcher who specialized in UFO crash retrievals. He got a first-hand count of a, a, count, a UFO crash right outside of Edwards. Um, the disk was apparently 50 feet in diameter and had numerous bodies on board, and it was quickly recovered. Um, in 1973, Kent Sellen was working at the base, and he had to drive to the other side. And he thought, oh, well, instead of going around this whole road, I'll just cut across the dry lake bed and get to the other side. Big mistake. He came into the middle of this area, and he came upon a Quonset hut, a big, big hut. And he slowed down as he approached it, because he saw you know, there was something inside. It was all lit up. And looking inside, he saw a giant silver disk parked there. And it was, he said it was obviously extraterrestrial. There was no way it was ours. And as soon as he stopped, he was surrounded by people with guns. And after that, he was basically interviewed and, and, uh, for a period of 17 hours, he said. And uh, he said he wished he hadn't seen it. Now, what's really interesting is in April 1991, there was a radio show in which three military contractors actually called up the radio show to, to tell their experiences at Edwards, which were really extreme. They said Edwards goes down about 20 stories, and uh, they were working there building the 
complex, expanding it, and uh, they were walking down the halls when they came upon a room with a window, and looking in the window, they saw gray-type gray ETs working there with humans. And uh, at that point, they were approached by guards who said, you shouldn't have done that, you're not supposed to be here, we didn't think you were here, get out now, and don't tell anyone. And uh, one of the guys didn't tell anyone, but the other guy did. He started talking about it, and uh, he ended up mysteriously dying a few months later. Um, but uh, it was a very interesting case, and as I said, now on February 17, 1954, um, Eisenhower allegedly had a meeting with ETs at Edwards Air Force Base. This, rumors of this event started immediately after the, meet, the meeting. He was supposedly playing golf when he disappeared, and uh, the press actually announced that he had been killed and retracted it a few minutes later, and the excuse was that he was at a dental appointment. But this is when these rumors started that uh, he actually was having a meeting with ETs of some type, it's not clear which type, but it apparently was not the Greys, um, who were willing to exchange or spiritual information, but uh, we wanted technology. And uh, they warned about the use of atomic weapons and uh, things like this. And I uh, wanted to make an announcement of their presence, but Eisenhower didn't want them to because he feared the impact on religion and society and things like this. And since, so, sounds like a crazy story, I know, but since then there have been a lot of people coming forth saying that they were witnesses there and that they have first, inf first hand information about the events that occurred there, um, much of which I wrote in UFOs Over California. So whatever is going on at Edwards Air Force Base, it's definitely being covered up. We haven't seen the last of it. And uh, it's a very, very extensive case. Okay, now I want to talk about uh, the underwater UFO activity in the Santa Catalina Channel. Um, when I first started investigating UFOs in 1987, I started receiving reports of UFOs over the water there in the, off the coast right here, between, I would say, uh, Santa Barbara mostly, down to Long Beach, you know, Santa Monica, Malibu, that whole area. And uh, a few of them were underwater UFOs, not a lot of them. And as time went on, I, you know, I actually just, when I wrote this book, UFOs Over California, I found a bunch of underwater UFO accounts. So I wrote a chapter about it, and it generated a lot of interest, and I wrote an article about it, and this brought in a whole bunch more accounts, which one thing led to another, until I got a flood of underwater UFO accounts. And I think that there is an underwater base there, and I'll tell you why. I'm not going to go into the sightings that have occurred over the water, because there's just so many of them. There's, I would say, 50, 100, 200 at least. Um, Ann Druffel has investigated a number of them. Uh, a number, Bill Hamilton as well. All the local investigators are aware of the activity in this area. Now, in uh, 1947, is when this activity began, there was a number of people up and down the coast who saw these objects going into the water. And around that time, uh, captains of ships in the San Francisco Bay in particular started to report a mysterious underwater mass, uh, like an, a reef or something, which kept changing locations. And it got to be such a dangerous situation that they called up the Navy, and the Navy sent a ship, the, um, the Mori. It was captained by Captain Hambly, and they went up there and they could not find the mast, but at that point it was reported down off the coast here in Southern California. So they went down and they actually located it with their depth sounders and uh, were trying to determine what size it was when it disappeared again and they never found it after that. So there is underwater activity stretching back from the very beginning. Um, in August 8, 1954, the Japanese steamship Aliki was off the coast and uh, right here in Long Beach. And they saw this fireball, what they thought was a fireball, darting down towards the ocean, then it went into the ocean, and then it came out, and it was still lit. And then it went back in, and then it went out, and it darted away. So that clearly was not a fireball. Um, in 1955, a, a long silvery object, like a torpedo, was seen by a number of witnesses emerging out of the water. This was on Santa Monica Beach. Now, one, one really amazing encounter, January 15, 1956, at Redondo Beach, 
This was in the evening. A number of witnesses, including police officers, night watchmen, lifeguards, and uh, residents, saw a very large, uh, they say 15 to 20 feet across, yellow disk, glowing, come swooping down out of the sky and land on the water, just maybe 100 yards offshore. And uh, they watched it for a few minutes, and then it sunk beneath the waves, and it was still so brightly lit, they could see it under the water. And all the water was bubbling, and the, they called the authorities, and more authorities came with dive, divers, with radiation um, Geiger counters, and this took several hours, and by the time they got out there, there was no evidence of this object. Um, but one month later, it happened again. Another giant UFO, or glowing object, was seen descending into the same exact area. Now, on a, here's a really bizarre encounter, which occurred on July 28, 1962, and this was in investigated by Jim and Coral Lorenzen. It was actually, I think, the only USO encounter um, in this area that I know of that involves humanoids. Um, and what happened was this captain of a fishing boat was six miles south of Catalina when he saw an a light ahead of him in the water. And as he got closer, he realized it was actually an object. It was a gray metal object. It was very low in the water, and on top of it were like five men. They were dressed differently in kind of suits, um, uniforms, and uh, they, were, they looked like normal people as far as you could tell. They were kind of in the distance. But as he was trying to identify this object, because it did not look like a normal submarine. It had no normal aft structure or anything like that. It was very low in the water. And what was most unusual was what happened next. This object actually turned towards the boat as if to ram it and came right up to it and then dived below the boat and it went on. And they said that there was no sound associated with this object, almost no swell. It moved much too quickly. And uh, Jim and Coral Lorenzen were convinced that it might be an actual UFO for, because this guy actually went to the Navy to report it. And they put silhouettes of submarines in front of him, including German, a Russian, and Japanese, and he was not able to identify it as any known sub. So I don't know. Um, in February 5, 1964, 11 people actually were sailing down the coast when they struck some metallic object in the water, which was not there after their boat sunk. Um, they had to be rescued by the Coast Guard, and they said, whatever we hit, it was metal, because it sunk their boat pretty quickly, the Hattie D, as it was called. Um, December 2, 1965, uh, Mrs. Irwin Cohen and her son were off San Pedro when they saw a glowing red object descend into the ocean. Um, here's a very interesting one which occurred on Catalina. Now, I could, I've gotten so many sightings of, around the area of Catalina and a number of abductions, um, so I don't know what's going on in Catalina Island, but I think it's in the center of all of this. Um, on Ju July 1968, Mike Jitlove was standing in Avalon Harbor, which is a tiny little harbor, and uh, he saw this gray metallic object, like a disc, rise up out of the water. He says it rose up about two feet. There was no markings on it. It looked just like dull gray metal. There was no windows or anything like that, no uh, mast. And after a while, it just sank. And uh, I would, wouldn't think much of it, except there's just so much activity going on in this area. Here's a, a, October 1968. This one is amazing. Sword fisherman George Heiner sees a white dome object. This was just off Catalina. And he sees it rise about 10 feet off the water, and then it sinks back down into the water, rises back up, sinks back down. Got a number of encounters like that, where these objects come swooping down, hover over the water, and are doing something to it. I don't know, they're, maybe they're using it for fuel. There's been some speculation about that. But, um, it's, it's very interesting in any case. Okay, in 1969, this is a, a gentleman I interviewed who, when he was a child, actually, he was a teenager, he saw a, a string of lights hovering over the coast. And he's like looking at it and thinking, you know, that's a very odd string of lights. He whipped out his walkie-talkie. And he actually picked up, um, intercepted a message from a Coast Guard ship down below, which said, was, there was a guy freaking out, saying, I don't know what this is, but it's off our bow, it's in the water, and it's moving around. 
So in the next day on the news, there was a, a number of reports of UFOs, which, which actually made it onto the news. In 1976, there was witnesses who saw this object flying. They didn't know what it was, it was just a, a kind of a white glowing object, horizontal to the sea. To the sea, then it turned 45 degrees in and went straight in. So these objects are not decelerating when they were hitting the water, which our aircraft would, of course, explode. And they're also coming out of the water at very, very high speeds. In 1980, I interviewed another lady. She was driving along the coast when she saw what she thought was a boat. And uh, she was just, but it didn't look like a boat. It looked like it was like different. It was a strange light. It was, she couldn't tell if it was on the water or hovering right above it. And she was about to point out to her friend, and at that exact instant, it shot straight up and disappeared. She's convinced, totally convinced, it was a UFO. Um, 1980, here's another really incredible account, which occurred between Santa Cruz and Santa Barbara Islands. Um, an electronics engineer was driving his fully equipped boat, it has all, all the latest equipment on it, when he saw a green glow ahead of him. This was at night, and he's like, how odd, you know, this is a boat and it's coming towards me and he couldn't pick it up on ra his radio. And so he stopped his boat because he didn't want to have a collision. It was a little bit foggy. And as this light came closer and closer, he realized it was underwater. And so he didn't know what to do, he just waited for it to approach. And it actually approached him and went right under his boat. And his depth sounder read it at being 100 feet beneath his boat. And it was 300 feet wide. He said he was very scared at this point because all his compasses started spinning, his, his electrical system failed completely, his radio went dead, and uh, the object finally passed. His compasses were broken after that, though. 1990, Bill Hamilton uncovered an amazing case in Marina del Rey, in which a number of people saw very large objects, 50 feet across or more, um, moving above the water and below the water, and they were emitting smaller objects, which were also moving in the water. And uh, in 1992, this, this is actually during the Topanga Canyon UFO wave, which I'm going to talk about in just a second, um, a gentleman said he saw an object that he was, must have been at least the size of a stadium. He says it was huge. He was on Venice Beach, right near LAX, not far from it, and this object just came roaring out of the water. It, not roaring, it was silent. But uh, it was huge, and he said it was actually had a number of smaller objects around it. And uh, it wasn't 100 feet, 200 feet, it was a giant, giant object. So, I, I mean, I don't know what's going on in this area, but uh, 1994, Rancho Palos Verdes, witnesses saw a m bunch of disks floating in the water. 2002, at Point Magoo, a witness saw objects moving above the water, and in perfect tandem, in the water below, he could see the glow of other objects moving at the same exact simultaneous speed. Um, January 2006, another lady saw UFOs over Santa Barbara. I mean, there's, I can go on and on. Um, there's uh, some cases which I didn't get to interview the people firsthand, but they're amazing. This one lady, she was in a glass-bottomed boat, tour at Catalina Island, when they said this object actually came beneath the glass bottom boat, it was glowing, and uh, nobody knew what it was, and finally moved away. Another person said that they were on a flying fish tour, when the boat suddenly hit something and wouldn't move, it just would not move, and uh, after it was locked to some sort of object in the water, and after the, the tour guides were getting very concerned, and finally it was released. Um, Another couple who lived on the tip of Palos Verdes said that they see this white little object rise out of the water um, periodically in the middle of the night, and they never see it come down, and it only comes out of this one, the same exact area each time. Um, another couple, they chartered a boat to Catalina, and uh, on the way to Catalina, this undersea object started circling their boat. Three or four times, they said, it couldn't have been more than 10 feet in diameter. So I, mean, I could go on, but you know, these, that is not the reason why I think there is actually an underwater base. I'll tell you why I think there's an underwater base. is because uh, of the people I interviewed who had abduction experiences. Um, one gentleman I interviewed was abducted actually in 1968. This is the same year as a number of sightings from Avalon Harbor. He was in a boat 
docked in Avalon Harbor when he and his friend had a missing time encounter. And uh, that's all they really remember was actually having the missing time. And uh, they went under hypnosis later and recalled being taken not inside a UFO, as most people would re recall, but into an underground area. And they said it was very large, it had rock walls, kind of weird primitive computers, and uh, they did not see gray type ETs, they saw praying mantis type ETs, which I thought was pretty interesting. Because another lady, Kim Carlsberg, said basically the same thing. She lives in Malibu, she experienced an abduction, and she was taken to this large underground area. And she's also encountered hybrid, or uh, the praying mantis type, grasshopper type ETs on several of her encounters. So I'm thinking, you know, where are these people being taken? The clincher for me came with the Topanga Canyon UFO wave. And I'll tell you why in uh, just a second, but let me see. Gosh, I'm running out of time. Um, let me talk a little bit about the Coronado Island UFO incident, which occurred in 1994. Um, March 26, 1994, six people went to Coronado to listen to a UFO conference, and they stayed in the Village Inn, a hotel, and uh, on that evening, all six of them experienced an encounter. They were in three separate rooms. I'll call uh, room, room one is where Mike Evans, the co-author of the book, was staying. And he woke up in the middle of the night to the room filling with light. He thought it might be a plane coming in, but he got up and went to the bathroom and thought he hit his lip. Um, when he woke up the next morning, there was a spot of blood on his pillow, but uh, his lip was fine. Instead, he had a puncture wound in his ear. And uh, he knew something had happened. Um, so when he went to breakfast the next morning, he asks his, his friends who were there. In room two were his friends, uh, Lori Angeloni and uh, I called the other lady Nancy. And uh, they had a really weird night too. Lori Angeloni actually remembered everything without the aid of hypnosis. Um, Nancy didn't remember very much at all. All she remembered was having weird dreams. And when she woke up, her blanket was wrapped like a Tootsie Roll and put around her neck and tucked into the bed so she couldn't get up. It was very bizarre. I've heard of this in a few other cases, though. I don't know what exactly that means. Um, but it turns up. And uh, she didn't go under hypnosis, but was only able to recall like this figure coming towards her. Whereas Lori Angeloni, she recalled the room filling with light and these gray-type ETs filed into the room through the wall. And this is fully conscious. She said they smelled like sulfur very bad. Um, she's had encounters all her life, as have all these witnesses, by the way. And uh, she said that they went straight to Nancy and basically took her into a beam of light and abducted her. And uh, that was it. And after like 15 minutes, they came back and put her back. And she was not able to move during this time and uh, was also very frightened. And meanwhile, in the next room, there was another couple, a man and his wife. And uh, they had a very strange night. The wife didn't remember anything. She, does, she refused to be interviewed about this. Um, but the husband said he heard a low humming noise over the hotel. He heard a man screaming, as did Lori Angeloni, by the way. Um, he remembered flashes of light and other things. And he find, when he heard about the other people's encounters, he decided to go under hypnosis as well. And he recalled a scenario that was very much like what happened in room two. Um, these aliens actually came through the ceiling this time in a beam of light, went straight to his wife and put her in the beam of light and took her through the ceiling. Um, about 10, 20, 50 so minutes later, uh, she was returned. And what's interesting about this case is a, a number of them have gotten really amazing physical evidence. Which I have a few um, photographs I want to show you. Um, and then we'll get to the slides. Here is the ET that each of them saw. And following this experience, he started, this is what actually caused Mike to go under hypnosis, where he recalled, um, he, following this experience, he kept waking up with bruises on his arms, puncture wounds, um, triangular-shaped marks. This happened uh, more than 
a half dozen times over the next six weeks or so, and uh, finally he decided to go under hypnosis. And this is how this whole Coronado Island incident came uncovered, is because Mike kept investigating it. And under hypnosis, he recalled seeing those types of beings. Um, Yes, they happen only at night. Um, this is the, the ET seen by one of the other witnesses. Thank you. Um, which he thought described as very old. Now, following this incident, following this incident, uh, Mike Evans had a high blood pressure attack, and uh, he rushed to the hospital. And that was when they said, well, what did you stick in your ear? You have a puncture wound here. And he's like, I do. I, um, that's when he started to really get concerned. And Mike is actually a registered nurse. And so he decided he would really start researching his case. And he w had a number of x-rays taken, which didn't show anything. But the MRIs did. They showed that he had objects in his brain located in kind of strategic areas, like the pituitary area or the visual cortex, or right by the ear. There's a little arrow there, which you can see. And um, if you want to look at these later, I'll, I'll have them out as well. Um, these are MRIs, and these are all in his brain, these tiny little white objects. And uh, he's not the only one who um, actually apparently had an implant. Nancy also woke up that morning and she had a scar. She didn't notice it right away, but she believes it did happen on that night. And uh, she happened to be one of the people who went to Dr. Roger Lear to have her implant removed. And it, of course, showed a number of very unusual properties, including it was composed of a metal that most related meteorotic iron, which is really bizarre. Okay, this is just a little bit of shameless self-promotion. Uh, this was my first book, UFO Healings, which, as I said, covered 100 cases of UFO healings. Um, next slide. My second book, One in 40, which covered basically all the family and friends and coworkers that I found out were having UFO encounters. And a lot of these cases that are in this book are local, and I'll be talking about some of them tonight. This is UFOs Over Topanga, which is still my best seller and I think my most exciting book. And uh, that's what I want to talk about some more tonight. Okay, now, this is an encounter which occurred in 1978 in Palm Springs to three friends, and they saw these darting lights, which they said were each different colors, moving at right angles. Um, I'm going to go through a number of these other cases that I investigated here in Southern California, which I think you probably haven't heard about. Next slide. This occurred in 1990 to Arnie Weiler. He had this very powerful impulse to look outside. And uh, as soon as he did, this pinpoint of light appeared and got brighter and brighter and brighter and then turned off. And whatever it was, it left uh, his eye damaged for two days. This occurred on 1983 um, in San Gorgonio Peak to a gentleman named Mark Grant who had overcome. He was a part of a group called the Wilderness Challenge. It, this group is people who have overcome drug and alcohol addiction, and as part of their journey, they climb up a mountain. And as soon as they got to the top of this mountain, they saw this object. Now, I don't know if this is a spirit quest type thing or a UFO, but this it was very, very bright, much brighter than it was comfortable to look at, very, very large, and darting around, and uh, totally silent. And after a few minutes, it either shrunk into itself or moved straight up. They couldn't quite tell which. This was in 1976 in Granada Hills before it was uh, all built up. Um, these gentlemen were in the foothills when they saw what they described as a house on fire flying through the air, a description that people have actually used those same words to me several times, which I, I find really interesting. It was bright red, it was leaving this trail of smoke, and it basically they, they said it looked like a structure, though. Whatever it was, it looked like a structure. And it scared them to death. They ran home, and uh, they expected it would be all front page news the next day, but there was not a sign of it. I asked them, well, did you tell anybody? And they said, no. And uh, of course, all, all the people I've interviewed, one in a hundred, I would say, report their sighting. 
And of course, people almost never report their abductions. It, it appeared to be some type of flaming object. I mean, I don't, it, it, it just went across the sky and it left this contrail, but uh, they don't know what it was. They don't think it was a fireball because it was too low and it was moving parallel to the ground. But uh, it's hard to say. This encounter occurred in 1978 in uh, Santa Clarita. Robert Murphy, he's a radiologist, saw this UFO land in the corner of his yard. And uh, he ran to go get his glasses, he's nearsighted, and when he returned it was gone. But the very next night, he says a Bigfoot showed up. Which I'm like, oh no, you know, I didn't want to investigate Bigfoot, but now I've run across a number of cases like this where people have seen Bigfoot, and sometimes in conjunction with UFOs. And uh, he didn't actually see the Bigfoot, he heard it. And he says his dogs were scared to death, he was way too scared to go out there, it was roaring. He said he heard it roar three times, I believe. And the next day he went out there and did find what he thought were footprints, but they weren't really well formed. This is a gentleman I interviewed um, where I work. I work as an accountant. Um, he said he was driving up here in 1983 in Paso Robles area when he saw a number of objects, he and his friends, circling other larger objects. And they actually pulled over to watch them and finally they were, like, they were really reluctant to say it, but, uh, they finally admitted that they were UFOs. And when they finally got over that disbelief, they started to chase him and they followed him as far as they could. They passed several other cars who were also watching these objects and uh, watched them for several hours before they finally lost sight of them. Um, this is actually my sister's ex-husband's um, brother. My sister's ex-husband's brother who saw this um, and graciously allowed me to interview him he and his whole family actually saw this multicolored object hovering over the Gardena area. And it was moving in really strange ways. It was going like over houses and like quartering the neighborhood as if looking for something. And I always tell people, you know, one person's UFO sighting is another person's abduction. There's probably someone else in that thing because that's what they're coming here for. This occurred in Fresno and I included this one because it's an unusual type of UFO encounter. Um, UFOs not only go into water, they can go straight into land. They apparently have the technology to move matter apart and might have underground bases in which there is no apparent entrance at all because of their technology is so advanced. This occurred in 1987 in Fresno to Ronnie Barron and his friends. They were driving a van through the desert and they thought it was a 747 about to land in front of them on the highway. Instead it veered, turned and dived into the ground. Really bizarre. This was in 1968. The Tanoe family was driving home when they saw this very unusual object, kind of high in the sky, near their house. And as they got closer and closer to their house, they realized it was pretty much hovering above their house. This was in Pacoina. And uh, they happened to have a very powerful pair of binoculars. And when they put the binoculars on it, they could make out portholes or windows or lights, something, and as they watched, this object then started to approach much closer and emit smaller objects, which started to fly around it. They became very concerned and were going to run inside and call the police, at which point the little objects went right inside the big one and it darted away. So apparently, they're, I think they're monitoring you know, people as they are watching them. This is a really incredible case. It occurred in 1983. This is at the George Page Museum, the La, La Brea Tar Pits, right there on the lawn. Arnie Weiler was there, he works with NBC, and he was setting up this peacock's tail, proud as a peacock, with all these lights in patterns. And uh, it was, you know, a lightworks show as a party for NBC. But what was interesting is, as soon as they turned this thing on, three UFOs came swooping down from very high up and hovered to examine this thing, which happens to look a lot like a UFO. And, uh, as I interviewed Arnie about this, um, he, I interviewed the guy who actually set it up, Rick Liebert. He's a special effects expert. He says, oh, this happens all the time. And he told me about another incredible encounter, which is this one in 1978 in San Diego, which was then the tallest building in San Diego. And uh, they were sending out an argon laser, with, which would play and beat with the radio stations. 
And it was designed to attract at attention. It was a publicity stunt, and it worked really well <laughs> because it attracted u some UFOs, at least two. One was very large and looked exactly like the artist, Kisara, who is here tonight, um, portrayed. Kisara actually drew all these pictures you're seeing tonight, so I owe her a huge debt of gratitude. She's worked very closely with me and the witnesses to try and get this art accurate. It, it, it is, and it's interesting, there was another smaller object. You see, he, the witnesses described it as a baby object, but after interviewing them, I realized that it was probably the same size, but just much higher up, because they had a lot of difficulty saying how high up this was. I personally think that this thing wasn't as low as they think it was. They said it was maybe 50 feet above the building. I think it was probably 1,000 feet up, and it was enormous and massive, because that's happened in a lot of cases that I've interviewed, the UFO actually does come close, and it's much bigger than people realize. This was one of the first cases I uncovered. This is my brother, who uh, was driving across the San Fernando Valley in 1978 in Reseda, when he, or actually they were parked when they first saw it, and were like, what is, what is this object? He and his three friends it had a dome on it. It was kind of a weird bottom to it, and it was just hovering in space. So they chased it. And it seemed to allow them to chase it. It sort of played cat and mouse with them and allowed them to chase it all the way across the valley. They passed several other cars who were also chasing it. And as soon as they got to the other side of the valley, it went up and darted to the other side again. And they're like, oh, well, that's you know, 50 miles or whatever it is too far to chase. So it was obviously playing with them. OK, this is an encounter which occurred in 1953 in Crescent. This is right on the... Uh, tip of Northern California to Sally Sanders. Um, that's actually a pseudonym that I used for her. She and her family were Filipino immigrants, and uh, they have this strawberry field, which um, they worked as a living. And uh, one day that they were picking strawberries, this was in, uh, let me see, 1953, when three discs showed up. And they said that these discs were very, very small, maybe 10 feet across maybe four feet thick, totally silent, no features at all, just gray metal, and they were whirling around very, very um, slowly. And uh, one of the witnesses, Sally, she, she said, I don't know how to explain this, but I started to get a message in my mind. She obviously hadn't really heard of telepathy, but she said thoughts were coming into my mind that were not my own, and they, it said, don't be afraid, we won't hurt you which is, of course, the first thing out of the E.T.'s mouths, pretty much, whenever people see them. Can I ask a um, sure. Do you have any authentic pictures? Yeah, I have some coming up. Yeah, and I've actually got a bunch here, too. Um, um, this is, uh, occurred on December 26, 1988, in Chatsworth, in the, in the San Fernando Valley. A lady was sleeping in a condominium complex with a number of other people when she woke up to find something grabbing her ankle. And uh, she said it felt like needle marks, two on each side. It was very painful. And she was like paralyzed and unable to wake up. And finally, she broke this paralysis and saw a figure, which she described as kind of a smoky apparition type figure, dart out of the room through the closed window and into the alley in the back. And in the alley in the back, she saw what she described as an egg-shaped object. It was flat white, obviously solid, and uh, parked there in the alley. And it went straight up as soon as this thing went inside of it. And she became very concerned. She called up her best friend. Turned out her best friend's boyfriend had, had an encounter that same night. And her best friend, Tracy Storr, guiltily admitted that she has a long history of these encounters and that it was her fault. And uh, next slide. This is what happened to Tracy's store. I mean, she's had a number of encounters with missing time and things like this, but this happened in the Marriott Hotel, um, which sounds unusual, but UFO encounters can happen anywhere. I've talked to people who've had UFO encounters in places you would least expect. Um, and uh, this was in Woodland Hills in uh, 1987. And uh, she, she described, she thought perhaps it was demonic. Um, but I asked her to describe it to me, and she gave this typical description of it, an ET, um, with a large head, a very thin body. And uh, 
She says after she struggled against it, it, it just disappeared at some point. She wasn't exactly sure how the encounter ended. Um, this occurred to uh, my sister-in-law, Melissa, and uh, she was walking by Stagg Street Elementary School in Van Nuys in 1982. This was around 11 o'clock at night when she saw what she thought was two children. This is right near her home, crowded suburb, and these two children were standing face to face, almost like they were kissing, but they weren't kissing. And as she got closer and closer, she realized, well, they're bald, they're very short, they look identical, they're wearing green jumpsuits. And then as she was like about 10 feet away from them, walking past them, they swiveled, hovering, and turned and looked directly at her. She said it was the biggest shock she's ever gotten in her life. She, was, she said it was like being woken up when you're awake. She realized they were not human. There was no way they were human. They were deathly white, huge dark eyes, a weird crease on their cranium, um, mandarin collars on this olive green jumpsuit. And uh, they didn't do anything, just looked at her. Her dog didn't react at all. And uh, she walked quickly as fast as she could without panicking and uh, went straight home. This is a, a case which occurred in Panorama City. And, uh, this was in uh, 1988 to a lady named Pat Brown, and uh, she didn't believe in UFOs until she went to see a channeler, and the channeler claimed to be an ET, and she's like, well, I want to go aboard a UFO, I want to see what it's like. And that was when her experiences started. She, and uh, she, st she said it was very terrifying at first, very scary, and uh, she didn't like it at all, but as her encounters progressed, they became more spiritual, and they eventually, the ETs taught her how to do hands-on healing. They taught her about her feminine, masculine side. They showed her like the, a negative band of thought energy that's surrounding our planet, and other weird spiritual stuff, which happens to a lot of the people that I talk to who have extensive UFO encounters. This is just a close-up. This is a lady um, who, she and her friend, we're sitting outside Pio Pico Library at exactly 9 o'clock because that's when the library closes when they saw a star-like object. Within one second, the star-like object dropped out of the sky right over the telephone wires, and it was a disk with colored lights spinning. Their mom drove up, and uh, they are like, Mom, look at that, what is that? And she looked at it, and I interviewed her. She says, I don't believe in UFOs. I said, well, what did you see? She says, well, you know, it had a, there was a disk, and... It had two sides, and there was lights around it, but I don't, you know, I don't believe in UFOs. And I'm like, well, what happened next? Well, it followed us home. This is what she said. I'm like, oh, okay. And the, the girls, of course, were very excited at this point. It was falling right low over the car. Next slide. And uh, this is in Pio Pico Town, the, cor uh, the Pio Pico Library in Koreatown. And uh, this disc followed them home. They live maybe 10 minutes, 5 minutes from the library. Um, they left it around 9, maybe 9, 10, the latest. And they went straight home, went to the house, second floor to watch this disc, move back, forth, and dart away. And uh, then they looked at the clock and it was 10.15. So they had lost a lot of time, 40 minutes about. And uh, the other, one of the witnesses was too afraid to walk home. They had, she had to be driven home. And she lived just like three doors down. Um, this occurred from 1963 to 1970, actually. This is a very extensive encounter involving two sisters, um, Susan and Karen Sands, who throughout their childhood were visited by what they called the Muddy Man. And uh, it would always go to the younger sister's bed, never the older sister. And it would come pretty much on a weekly basis. And uh, later on as an adult, the younger sister had a number of encounters in which a UFO would land in her backyard and her son started to also complain of little men coming into his room, and he had a scar exactly where she has a scar. And uh, she was going to go under hypnosis, but elected not to. Okay, now, now just a few more cases before I get to the Topanga Canyon case and some really good stuff. Um, this is, occurred in a Camp Julian in the San Bernardino Mountains in 1983 to a lady who, who is a actually a legal secretary. She and her friends would go out there and watch these UFOs. They did it for year after year, and it was kind of a fun pastime. But, but then, when they started seeing these objects over their home in Reseda, and uh, 
in a very crowded section of Rusita. Next slide. And there were all these, just these star-like objects, but then one evening in uh, 1987, Kelly Robinson woke up to find this guy in her bedroom, actually three or four of them. She, she said that they had skin like a leather glove, that they had really hard fingers but no fingernails, and they were grabbing her saying, don't be afraid, we won't hurt you, we want you to come with us. And she, she remembered this fully consciously, and she screamed, no, no, I don't want to go, I don't want to go, I've got a job. And they're like, and so the next thing she knows, she's inside this object, and they're examining her, and they said, we'd like to cut your arm. And she said, no, you know, they cut her arm. And they said, we need to do an operation on your brain. And uh, she panicked at that point, she was very upset, and she was kind of lost consciousness at that point, and woke up the next morning, instantly looked at her arm, there was a scar, I saw it like the next day, because she was actually working at my office at the time. And uh, she, she, she was very upset about it, and these encounters continued. Next slide. Over the next few months, these weird lights came into her room, this happened like three or four times, and they were the ETs apparently, because they started talking to her telepathically, and they would like go into her brain and knock her unconscious and start taking her thoughts or, or recording her thoughts or sort of researching them. They wanted to know about her work life. They wanted to know about her re re church life, her um, sex life, and all this stuff, which actually gave her some comfort. She felt like that made them a little more human. But she just wished that they wouldn't come in at night and scare her half to death. Um, about... A month after she was having all these encounters, her mother had this experience, which she likes to call a dream, though she has admitted it's probably not. And this is what investigators call a baby presentation, which I've researched a number of cases like this. I don't think they're as common as a lot of people think, but it does happen. I think the ETs are taking human um, reproductive material and creating hybrids or what have you. And uh, that's apparently true in this case because Diane, the mother, was taken on board and she was told to hold these babies, to love them, that they need love, and that what happened to them was not supposed to happen this way because a lot of them were genetically damaged. Um, there was like Siamese twins and a lot of other weird genetic damage to these babies, but they didn't have anyone to hold and love them, which is a theme that turns up again and again in these encounters. This is a drawing, again by Kisara, of the ET that seen by Paul Nelson in Catalina Harbor. I already mentioned his abduction where he was taken into a, an underground area. Next slide. And this is an ET seen by a lady who lives in Acton, who's had a number of incredible encounters, and, uh, which are pretty typical in a lot of ways, though very spiritual. And she ha was having so many sightings and brought forth so many witnesses. I asked her, well, I I'd like to see a UFO. And she actually made an appointment with the ETs. They told her to show up along the 210 freeway, just like near La Tuna Canyon, off this dirt road, and they'll show up. So we went there. Um, I, her, my sister-in-law, and my brother hiked up this little dirt road, and right when I got to the top with her, this giant object showed up. It was gold, sparkly, the most beautiful thing I've ever seen, maybe 50 feet away, 20 feet off the ground, and it just moved quickly around the bend and disappeared. The other two people didn't get to see it, my brother and sister-in-law. I should have written that down, but uh, I have it written down somewhere, but that was like 1996, perhaps. And she... No, I've seen like 20 since then. I've... When I started investigating this stuff, I, I started having a lot of encounters. One time, a UF, I don't know what it was, a ball of light came and hovered above my windshield, in front of my windshield, and then darted away. And that's happened like three or four times. And These are not reflections. And, and yeah, I've had a number of sightings since then but usually associated with other witnesses when I'm with them or investigating their case. And uh, this is again is uh, the lady in Acton who said that she's had very loving encounters with gray type ETs. You hear a lot about emotionless ETs. All right, next slide. Yeah, they were holding her as a child. Okay, now this is still my favorite story, the Topanga Canyon. Um, starting in, on June 14, 1992, 
there was a wave of sightings over Topanga Canyon, which is located between Santa Monica and Malibu, right off the coast. And uh, on that day, on, a number of people called the police, a number of people called the local newspaper station to report UFOs. One couple said that they were driving through the coast and they were lifted up by this object. Another couple said that they were followed, as did several other people. And uh, the editor of the newspaper called me up and asked me to investigate. And so I did, and I eventually located more than 17 independent adult witnesses who saw incredible activity on that night alone. And this wave went on for two more years and involved pretty much the entire range of phenomena. Next slide. Um, this is the Topanga Canyon, and in the center is Topanga Canyon Boulevard, where these UFOs were chasing people up and down the boulevard on June 14th, and for actually for like two years this went, went on, and there's activity still going on, by the way. This is the northern end. It's a very isolated area. It's the largest inner city state park um, in, I think, the world. It's tied by Griffith Park, and they're kind of arguing which one is larger. But uh, it's very, very large and inaccessible. This is a sighting which occurred in 1978 to a witness who's actually a pilot, and uh, she saw this egg-shaped object over Topanga Canyon. It made a low buzzing noise and just sort of floated lazily away. Um, this is a sighting which occurred, again, right before the wave of sightings. This was like in 1989, I believe. This very, what actually happened was a, a small UFO approached, followed by two other smaller UFOs, and then this very large object. And it sent on a beam of light onto the house, which frightened really badly a couple of the witnesses, and they couldn't give good interviews. They were too badly frightened. But one of the witnesses was not so frightened, and he said he wanted to jump into the light. So I mean, he gave a really good interview and described it clearly. Here's another case where uh, three boys saw two objects coming from either side of the sky, come whirl around each other, and then go off in either direction. No plane or helicopter could do what they did, not at that speed with that maneuverability. That's probably the most common type of sighting I've uncovered in this area. This was a case of a friend um, a, who actually had a missing time encounter on Mulholland Drive overlooking the valley. He and his friend were watching a triangular formation of lights for like 15 minutes when suddenly they changed color and darted towards them. The next thing they knew, they were not coming towards them but going away from them. And uh, they were very, very frightened, didn't want to tell anybody, and were uncertain about how much time had passed. There was some confusion there. And uh, this is the article that I wrote before this wave of sightings happened. So this is why the editor actually called me up and asked me to uh, interview or you know, investigate the incident. And uh, this is the article that the editor of The Messenger wrote, which describes the uh, sighting on June 14, 1992, which I actually have a police tape for you, and I want to play a segment for you in just a second. Um, next slide. All right, now, on that night, um, several people called the Lost Hills Sheriff's Station. And I have, this tape is not the greatest quality, but uh, it's got four calls that I'd like to play for you. The total length of the tape is about 10 minutes. So the first call, I would say, is about two, three minutes long. And it comes from a couple who had been eating on the coast highway at Gladstones for fish. They drove up north through Topanga Canyon. This was sometime before or around midnight when they saw a UFO, and I'll let them describe it. Tonight, 
side. We don't take drugs. Okay. My girlfriend and I have no history of psychotic problems or hallucinations. Okay. And I think we're going to go see a psychiatrist tomorrow or to an emergency room after she calms down. What exactly uh, happened to you? I'm ashamed to tell you because I think you're going to think you're crazy. We don't know who to tell. Okay. Well, why don't you go ahead and tell me and maybe I can advise you as to uh, proper people to talk to. Officer. If you want to. We were up at the Panga Canyon mm -hmm. where there was a deep, there's a deep canyon. There's a deep, you know where the canyon gets really deep? Mm -hmm. And we saw what we thought was a bright light up in the sky. Okay. And we had a very uneasy feeling because it was moving and we both felt it was following us. Oh, okay. All of a sudden, on top of us, was this extremely bright object that we could hear. It wasn't a helicopter. Okay. It was a high-pitched sound. And we lost control of our car. Okay. And it lifted us up in the sky. It lifted us up off the ground. Now, I'm telling you, I have never been more frightened in my life. Okay, what happened then? We were put down, we lost uh, our memory for, I don't know how long, maybe a couple minutes. And uh, it wasn't there anymore. Okay, uh, I don't believe in these things, I'm telling you, I'm a normal human being. I have a job, a good job. My girlfriend has a good job. She's a nurse. Okay, are both, both of you okay? Is the car okay? Or? The, the car is all right, We're, but we feel we are very disoriented. We got home by the grace of God. Okay. My girlfriend is welcome. Okay, that's the first call. I apologize again for the quality of the tape. The other calls are clearer. Um, but uh, that guy, you could see, was practically near tears. And this was not a happy experience for him. I was not able to interview these witnesses um, as they were anonymous. And uh, I had to edit the calls from the um, other three calls that came in because they were pretty lengthy. But I've narrowed them each down to about three minutes. So and I'd, I'd like to play the second one for you, which is also a couple who was actually eating at the same restaurant on the same evening and was apparently very near this other couple. But they actually got out to look at these objects. Um, the tape is too loud? Gladstones for fish? Okay, and next slide. sound very strange, officer. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm almost embarrassed to discuss this over the telephone, except that my girlfriend was a witness. Did anyone in call in and report anything strange happening in Topanga Canyon tonight around about an hour ago, hour and a half? No, they didn't. What happened? Well, my girlfriend and I saw three very strange God, I'm, who, who does one report UFOs to? The Air Force. The Air Force? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. Well, either well, that's those and fish spiked our, uh, put something in our wine, or we're hallucinating, because we saw something really weird tonight driving up to the Panga Canyon. Okay, what did you think? We saw three UFOs, discs, flying discs, in the canyon. Where were you in the canyon? Real high up past, uh, Sassafras Nursery, where the canyon gets real deep. Hmm. What did they look like? They were softers. I, I mean, they were softers. And then uh, they were they were following us above our car. Uh -huh. And then all of a sudden we stopped the car and we got out and we saw them. We saw we 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 watched them. And within I'd say three seconds, like a bat out of hell, they just went. Poof, they were gone. They went straight up in the air. Did they do anything? No. Other than just fly by? No. No. They didn't do anything to us. They just flew by. And I was wondering if there was any, like, uh, atmospheric disturbances tonight or any kind of water balloons or something. Nothing that I'm aware of. 
Well, <laughs> they, we, we thought maybe there was a possibility they were helicopters, except they didn't make any noise. Uh huh. Well, I know my girlfriend and I, we both watched it. We just got home. Now, I mean, I don't live in Malibu, but I, I was just very curious as to find, to find out if anyone else had reported something. No, sir. Well, maybe it's, uh, like I said, maybe Gladstone spiked their wife. <laughs> so is the Air Force you report these things to? Yes. So what would, the, you wouldn't happen to have their number, would you? No, uh, uh, they'll probably just think we're nuts anyhow. Well, I guess there's nothing much more that can be said. I'd be interested in knowing if anyone else saw anything. Well, nobody called us. Well, I don't, I don't know. We saw what we saw. Well, I guess maybe, maybe we had too much wine. <laughs> All right, thanks. Uh, sorry to keep, keep sorry That's okay. to you. All righty. Okay, that, that was the second call. Of course, there was a number of witnesses who I interviewed on that night. There was one couple who was driving north through the Canada around that time, and they saw five lighted objects whirling through the canyon. And uh, as they approached the top of Topanga, which overlooks the San Fernando Valley, the husband joked to the wife, maybe they're UFOs. And suddenly it wasn't a joke anymore, because they could clearly see that they were UFOs. They were following the height of the ground perfectly. They were perfect disks with colored lights. Um, hard, hard to say. Next slide. Um, one couple I interviewed lived very, very high on the ridge on Saddle Peak, which overlooks the ocean. It overlooks the valley and pretty much everything in the area. And uh, they said around 8 o'clock that night, they noticed that the sky had some weird lights in it, a weird bar of light. And I thought, that's odd. It got dark. They started watching a movie when flashes of light started coming up from behind the ridge towards the ocean. And uh, they ran outside and they saw these disc-like objects, these white ovals, rise up from behind the ridge, one at a time. As they watched, one would rise up, would dart away, and another one would take its place, dart in another direction, followed by a third. About ten objects came up from behind this ridge and uh, darted to various locations. And they're like, wow, that was weird. And they went back inside. About 10 minutes later, it started again, and there was a repeat performance. 10, maybe 20 objects came up, same thing. A couple of times, they came right over their heads, and they could see this weird, what they described as a sign shape, or a sign, like a mathematical symbol. And uh, they said it started to frighten them. They did not want these things to stop. They were much larger than they thought. Um, occasionally, one would stop in an area, and, but most of them were just going to all different locations. And uh, they went back inside after it stopped. Um, 10, 15 minutes later, it started again. So they started to count it. They counted. Um, so this ha happened pretty much for a period of two, three hours, um, maybe six, seven, eight times, and they counted eventually 200 objects. Now, when the wife said that, the husband's like, no, 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 it was only 100. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, 100, 200, you know. He admitted actually that he didn't count them. The wife was the one who was counting them because she was so upset by it. And what I think is fascinating about this is that they're not coming from above. We have not one, not two, not three objects. We have 200. And where are they coming from? Below. And this is my real clincher, I think, for why I think there is some sort of a base, if not in Topanga Canyon, underwater there. Because where are you going to fit 200 UFOs? This has got to be a very large airport, a base for these UFOs which I think they've chosen because it's a perfect way, place to hide and undetected next to a very large population center, which is like other hotspots like the Hudson Valley area. Um, I think they use it sort of like a hunter's blind to hopefully just photograph us, not hunting us, so to speak. <laughs> But uh, yeah, there are a number of cases on that night. A num another gentleman I interviewed was driving south towards the ocean, and he pulled over because he saw a bar of light in the sky. This was around 9 o'clock in the evening, and there were 20 or 30 objects circling around it. And it was so bright, it was casting shadows on the ground, and uh, it was just really incredible. Now, I want to play the third call for you, which is very interesting. It's from a gentleman who actually lives in the canyon, um, in the area where all this activity was going on. So again, it's like two minutes, three minutes long. Central word. Uh, uh, helicopters or something flying up in the canyon tonight that have unusually bright lights. Not that I'm aware of. I see. There's, there's a 
there's no aerial activity going on up there? Not, not as far as we know. Why? What did you see? They lied. Um, because about a, an hour ago, uh, I was up in the canyon, and my wife and I were working up there. There was a, a very, very bright light coming above our home uh, into the window. And we went out to look at it, but we could like, see an extremely bright light uh, hovering above us, but we couldn't hear anything. Where is the panda? Uh, it's approximately, do you know what a staff and press nursery is? Yes, I do. Okay, it's, I'd say a mile above that. A mile uh, north of it? Yes. Okay, um, did you hear anything or no. see anything besides the bright light? No, we didn't hear anything. Okay. Okay, what, your name is Mr. Thompson? Yes. Yeah. Okay, hold on. She's, she's going to get the officer who handled all these calls. It's strange. something that we should investigate, sir. Uh, what is your name? Deputy Murray. You, there weren't any helicopters. Excuse me, one second. There weren't any helicopters flying out tonight? No, sir. But that's not that It was nothing on the ground. Well, they they usually aren't in the ground. They're usually in the air. Yes, but the damn thing didn't make any noise. Uh, if in fact this was truly a UFO, no, no, no. I, that's what I don't. I don't believe in such things. Well, I do. And if in fact it was, then uh, you know their technology is much farther along than ours. And yeah, I would think. Is there any military? We're, we're new here. We, we've just moved here about three months ago. Uh -huh. Is there military in the area? What's that? Is there any military in the area? Is there any what in the area? Is it military. Any, is, is there an air force base there? No, sir. Well, you know, to tell you the truth, it was the strangest thing I've ever seen. Uh, the only sort of noise we did here was a sort of a high-pitched hum. Do you ever eat a Gladstone? No. Where, where, where is that? Uh, down on the beach. No, I don't know the area so well. I've been only for about six months. Hi, uh, my name is Jeff. Okay, that's the third call. He, he was actually woken up by this object which hovered over his home and lit it up, the entire interior. Now this tape was snuck out of the police department and leaked to me. Um, and the police lied about the calls that they received. I found out later, Topanga is a pretty small town. And I went to a dinner party where there was someone who was there who was married to one of the police officers. And she said that that station has collected 300 accounts in one year. And, and I'm like, 300? That sounds like a lot. And, and she's like, no, it's, a, it's at least 300. And I wasn't sure if I believed her, even though she had some information that was on this tape that is confidential. So she clearly had some inside source. And a couple of years later, I interviewed another person who happened to be at the same dinner party and uh, told the same exact story, that the police are sitting on a number of these encounters. And I called them up, the police. They verified it, that this incident took place. They wouldn't release me the tape, though I, didn't, I had already gotten a hold of it at that point. Um, they weren't coming from above. They were coming from behind a ridge. So I, I don't know how many objects. That's, that's a lot of objects to come up from behind a ridge. So <clears throat> I, I want to play you the last call for the state, and then I've got just like 10 more minutes, and I'll open it up to answers or questions and answers. And I've got a bunch of UFO photographs I also want to pass around, which are, I wasn't able to get onto slides, but they're really amazing. So this is the last call, and come, it's very, very short comes from a gentleman who was driving south through the canyon on that night. Yes, uh, can you all tell me, did you, did you all have uh, helicopters up at the Panda Canyon tonight? We didn't. I don't know if the fire department or if LAPD did, but we did not. Because, uh, well, I was... What did, you, what did you see, sir? About an hour ago, I was going down over the Panda Canyon, and I, I think they were helicopters because they were shining damn bright lights on me. Mm -hmm. But uh, they kind of chased down the, the, the road a bit. Where did you see them exactly, sir? Uh, we all must have think, though. It was... There's a, a theater 
called the Will Gear Botanical Theater. It's where old Topanga kind of meets new Topanga. It's actually further north than that, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's above. By the nursery? Past the past nursery? Yeah, kind of close to there, yeah. Mm. What did you see exactly? Oh, I, I, I can't really tell you what I saw because it was so damn bright. But they were kind of chasing it down the, the way a bit. How many of them? One, I guess. But the only, the only thing is, I think they were helicopters, but I sure couldn't hear you sound. Mm. Well, I, I really don't know what to tell you, because like I say, we weren't up there. Uh -huh. uh, and if the fire department was up there, we would more than likely know about it. And LAPD has a small piece of Topanga, but it's further down towards... Uh, towards the coast area, and they have just a very little piece of it. Is there a cop, a helicopter that goes to make it at all? No. Well, it sure gets a lot of cut off of that, right? Hmm. Very, very bright. And it's kind of like... Well, the quality of the tape kind of degrades at that point, but uh, you get the picture. Something really incredible happened on that night, and it didn't stop that on that night. Um, over the next two weeks, call, more calls came in. One call came from a family who lived on Entrada, which said that a UFO was landing right outside their house, right here. Um, they also believed that the wife believed she might be being taken on board because she was having some very bizarre dreams. And uh, she was actually pregnant at the time with a very unusual pregnancy. She had had twins, but had lost one in utero. And uh, the chances of the other surviving, the doctors told her, were like one to five million. And that's when this UFO started landing and taking her on board. And they said, seemed that they were very interested in her pregnancy, and she believes that they were benevolent. Um, they told her that there's going to be future disasters, and the political system will eventually fall apart, and don't support it, because if you are supporting it, you're a part of the problem. <laughs> Here's the drawings that both she and her husband made of these UFOs that they saw landing pretty much every couple of weeks for three days in a row in this field outside their home. And while they were seeing this stuff, I was interviewing several other people who were also seeing activity in this area, mostly lights, um, a few with solid craft. But uh, this, one of these was actually very large, and the other was extremely small. One time, they were, these objects will always make a, a low buzzing noise. And uh, one time, they heard this low buzzing noise, and the husband's like, no, that's a VW bug, and it's, it's coming up the road. And they stood up and looked out the window, and it was a VW bug, but right above it, maybe 10 feet, was this little tiny UFO casting a violet light, a really eerie light, he said, and it was maneuvering like the, nobody's business. And uh, he wasn't sure if these people in the bug saw it or not, but it was so low it went under the telephone wires. Um, this is a lady who lived in the same area who said that she experienced a bedroom visitation by an ET, which she didn't actually see, but she says it examined her physically with a pen-like instrument, um, very personally, and uh, took her a long time to wake up from this afterwards. And she's had a number of sightings as well in the area, and uh, later went under hypnosis and did recall a typical abduction scenario. Um, this is my sister, who saw a UFO for two days in a row. I was so upset when she didn't call me. Um, she says she didn't want to sound like a woman all scared in the middle of the night, because she was scared. This object was hovering right in the crack of her curtains. She had just had her baby, like three days before. There's a lot of cases where UFOs are interested in reproduction and pregnancy and things like this, and this seemed to be true in her case. She said it showed up two days in a row, and she went outside and looked at these objects, and they would move up and down and sideways and back and forth, and there was a number of them. And, uh, it was, she was unable to wake up her uh, boyfriend at the time, the, father's, the father of the child. Um, this is another gentleman who was out four-wheeling in Topanga when he became stuck, and they had to walk home, and it was late at night, and while they were walking home, they saw this star-like light, again, the most common type of encounter that people see. But I'm, I've gotten all kinds of cases of landings, people being abducted, a lot of, there's like six cases of cars being chased down the road. 
And this is a flyer I put up, which generated a huge response. Um, every time I put this flyer up, I would get a flood of calls. I'd go back to put more flyers up, they'd be gone. I could not keep these flyers up. Um, this is another case. This is a gentleman who actually called me from the flyer. He saw this object come and, down, and land down in the creek, and he was too frightened to stay, so he drove. He didn't want to be abducted, so he drove quickly away, and he, saw, he said a homeless person, a vagrant, also who saw the object and was equally frightened and running in the opposite direction. <laughs> um, this is a lady who was so upset by her encounter, she actually called me from a phone booth and wouldn't give me her name. Um, she was driving into Topanga when she saw objects moving at right angles. I'm not sure why they do this. Um, I've heard speculation that it's to avoid radar detection. Um, but she said it was as if they were putting on geometric symbols. And this is something I've heard over and over again. And I actually talked to someone who was abducted once and was inside a UFO when it was making these types of maneuvers. Um, this is another case involving uh, Bruce Merrifield and Raina Massey who were driving through the canyon when they saw this object. It stopped for them, turned on its belly and lit up like 50 lights. He's an aircraft designer. His father is also an aircraft designer. So he, he knows aircraft and he says this was not any type of known craft. And he described it vividly and it was a very, very unusual shape. Um, not a disc at all. And actually on that evening I was in Topanga doing a UFO stakeout and had a really incredible sighting. I, we were all meditating with our eyes closed, trying to bring them in, <laughs> so to speak. And I just had an impulse to look up, a really strong impulse. And I, I just, oh my god, they're out there. I bet they're out there. And I looked up and I saw this pinprick of light. And it expanded, 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 like something coming down or something. And then it just winked out. And it was only a, a very short sighting. But I kind of got a, I don't know, almost a telepathic feel from it, like they were saying hello but it was at the same time, very near the same location. This is a pilot who saw uh, three UFOs over the Santa Monica Bay when he, while he was um, with his student. There was a, a wave of sightings of red objects over Santa Monica in 1980. Um, I just want to go quickly through these last slides so I can get to the uh, photographs here. This is actually a photograph that was taken by a lady named Judy. This was about two years after the initial Topanga Canyon UFO wave. And she lives in Malibu. And she said she saw these objects coming up from below and uh, in clusters. And she grabbed her camera and actually snapped, I think, three photographs, three or four photographs. And this is the best one. And there's an inset, an enlargement. This is exactly the same thing that the other couple saw. These white oval shot objects coming up in large numbers. And there's a photograph of it. It's, so this is pretty much what you would have seen if you were there in Topanga that night. And these are just some of the articles that have been um, written about the area. Interestingly, the Santa Monica Mountains has a long history of Native American habitats, and they have a number of cave paintings, which appear very suggestive. I just talked to the gentleman tonight who saw some even more suggestive cave paintings than these. The Chumash and Gabrielano Indians apparently were, or may have been having contact because they did a lot of these uh, type of drawings. Okay, well, that's pretty much um, it for my lecture. I do have some photographs that I'd like to pass around while um, I answer any questions that you guys might have. But I would like to say that um, I believe UFOs are real, of course. I think there's an overwhelming amount of evidence proving that. I think. Basically, as Jim Mars says, the UFO controversy is over, and the time to, is now to decide what to do. I mean, I think we're really at the edge of disclosure. We're at the edge of having open official contact with ETs. I think their contact has been escalating since the 1940s and uh, has pretty much continued to get more and more intense to where there's now major sightings over city centers like Phoenix, like Topanga, which is right outside of LA, um, like the Hudson Valley wave, the Gulf breezeways, the Belgium wave. There's these huge waves of sightings. Pretty soon these UFOs are going to show up, in my opinion, and they're just not going to go away. I don't think they're hostile. I don't think there's any evidence of Nazi-like torture in abduction accounts. It seems to me that they do have an agenda, and often they're a little bit uncaring, but I don't think that they're evil, and none of the people that I've interviewed believe that they're evil. 
But uh, that's my lecture. I want to thank you very much for attending and. Thank <laughs> you.